Hello, uh, my name is Emilio Taltike, and I'm a mechanical industrial engineer with Burn Design Lab. And today I'm presenting on our partnership with the International Lifeline Fund to upgrade their stove factory. So a quick overview of uh, what I'll be presenting on today is uh, I'll give a background of the factory. I'll go talk about the observations from our visits, uh, some of the process improvements, the infrastructure improvements that we've implemented, and then applications to other factories in the future. So a quick background on the factory. Uh, it's located in northern Uganda. There are about 125 staff members, uh, roughly 35% female. Uh, they make three different kinds of stoves, um, charcoal, clay wood stoves, and institutional. Uh, but for this presentation, I'll only be focusing on the charcoal stoves. So they came to us with the goal of improving their production capacity from 5,000 charcoal stoves per month to 15,000 charcoal stoves per month um, uh, without increasing their labor force. So they want to do so efficiently and not just um, hire more labor for their current production processes. And they also want to improve the stove quality and consistency. Uh, right now it's fairly artisanal, so each stove can vary uh, from the next. So a quick note on our approach, uh, we have four key points of human-centered design, uh, which means uh, a lot of trips to the field where we want to understand how the factory works and uh, what solutions they are likely to adopt. We also want it, our approach to be uh, sustainable. So this means choosing uh, the appropriate machines. You know, We've done a lot of research on what machines might work, and we want to be careful to choose ones that will thrive in this environment. Um, we also want to develop a culture of continuous improvement uh, to where we're not just solving current problems, but looking forward to what problems might occur in the future. And uh, we also want to do so in incremental improvements. Uh, you know, we don't want to just choose machines and then drop them off one day. We want to create an environment where uh, machines will thrive. And a quick note, one of my colleagues will be doing a separate presentation just on machine selection, so I won't focus on too much in this presentation. Uh, now, observations from our visits. Uh, we first visited back in November 2020 and have had a total of three visits up until now, about 150 days in the field. Some notable observations, um, unreliable electricity. This is important for us to note because we want to understand what solutions are possible. And we also noticed uh, abandoned machinery. Uh, other organizations have come in in the past and attempted to implement different improvements and uh, they weren't sustained for one reason or, or another. So it's important for us to understand that so we know and uh, can avoid making similar mistakes. Now we'll be emphasizing on the sheet metal processes because there are the three main departments, uh, Kleiner, clay liner production, uh, sheet metal processing, and the painting and packing. Uh, but with the sheet metal processing, you know, there's a major bottleneck. They need about 576 metal jackets a day. They currently produce about 380. And I'll play the quick video here just so you can see. Uh, the fabricator here is producing these metal jackets to their side. And just so we can understand the flow of the factory, we see the assistants working around them, supplying them uh, with the parts. So the goal of the machinery is to pull work from the fabricator because each fabricator can make, uh, depending on how skilled they are, 25 to 30 a day, and take some of the simpler processes and give them to the assistants and allow the fabricators to then uh, make more metal jackets in a day. So focusing on some of the specific processes, uh, the first one is the circular cutting. Um, as you can see here, this is how they would mark the parts in the past, uh, very unergonomic, very space intensive, uh, very difficult, time consuming, you know, all, all of those things. And um, this is how they, after they cut the outer diameter, this is how they would cut the inner diameter with chiseling. Um, it leaves a very rough edge as well as uh, being very time consuming. Um, as a quick note, I did speed up some of these videos just for the purposes of time. So now showing our solution, uh, after lots of research, we decided to go with a uh, Pexto hand-powered circle shear, uh, which we refurbished at Burn Design Lab. So I'll go ahead and play the video as I speak more on it. But you can see that it allows me to quickly change between inner and outer diameters. Uh, it leaves a smooth finish. And I also want to note that we designed the stops ourselves. 
And uh, again, that allows us to, for different stove models, cut different diameters uh, very quickly. And as well, it eliminates uh, marking time. So uh, an example of that solution. So now jumping into the linear cut. So uh, the linear processing, again, you know, very labor intensive, um, takes up a lot of space and uh, dependency on gauges and marking. So you can see them. This is uh, really just uh, takes almost a whole day to do um, by itself. And just showing a video here, again, sped up, but someone going through and then making each individual cut after they've done all the marking. So uh, an example of an incremental step or improvement, uh, we call it the table and kit method. Uh, again, it's a step towards machines and also it gets them from processing everything on the ground to processing things uh, on a specific table and a place. And as well with the kit method, it changes their nesting diagram to where they are now pulling specific parts from specific places. So uh, in the past, they would just mark and cut out uh, the bigger parts and then cut out smaller parts from whatever scrap that they could find. But this tells them where exactly and how many parts of each uh, they are getting. So I'm gonna go ahead and play the video while I continue to speak over it. You can see them now working as a team. It takes up less space. And um, again, the, the biggest thing here were the signs of adoptability. Uh, we wanna make sure that the changes we make uh, that they actually like and that they take ownership of. And we, we saw lots of signs of that. They were requesting more templates to be made for different stove models. They even requested a second cutting table. And uh, most importantly, they were still using this process um, even after we were gone. So this is uh, not the final uh, improvement, but it's it's a step towards getting them to get used to changes that we're making. And um, again, building that environment where we think uh, machines can then thrive. So now showing what the final solution will be, which is a tin knocker table shear. And again, I'll show the video. This is a video of us prototyping it at Burn Design Lab. Um, again, the benefits, it eliminates marking time, uh, completely human powered. And uh, the only thing here being that the sheet metal they use is very thin and uh, the current backstops that all these machines come with don't work for the sheet metal because it'll flop down before it can reach. So we, we do have to develop our own uh, custom backstop system, uh, which this the video here is showing a prototype of one, but we, we're confident in this being um, the final solution. So now jumping to space utilization in 5S. So some observations that we had were there were lots of uh, slow moving inventory in high volume production areas. There were piles of dangerous scrap everywhere. And uh, these are improvements that can be made with li limited to no capital investment. Uh, and then, so again, here talking about the, the 5S just being uh, an organization methodology. It's a modern manufacturing principle, something that we, we can easily implement. And as you can see in the video, that was how they uh, process parts in the past. So as a part of all this, we also have to develop the infrastructure. Um, one of the reasons being the current infrastructure is very poor for material flow. There's gaps and elevation changes in between the buildings. So they have to throw the stoves at some point in order to move them from one building to another. Uh, as well, it's just not a great environment for the machines that we wanna bring in. We need level floors, we need protection from the environment and um, all of these things in order to make sure that the machines last uh, as long as they can and are as effective as possible. Uh, and again, just a quick photo here of uh, another part of the infrastructure. This is this walkway is a main artery for traffic uh, and they're pushing wheelbarrows and um, to, to finally go through a process improvement like this was huge for production flow. Some, some final notes on the infrastructure improvements. Um, we also are making two completely new buildings with strong quality, high strength floors in order for the machines. Um, there was also a paint spray booth improvement project undergone, uh, remodeling some of the floors and um, just more shelving created. Originally parts were just stored anywhere on the ground and now having them be in specific places. So currently where we are in the project, uh, the table and circle shear were just created and set to arrive in roughly early May. Uh, our goal is to visit again and to train and observe the machines in use. And uh, some of these observations uh, will help shape decisions on the second round of machines. We're hoping the second round of machines will be purchased and arrive uh, later this year. 
a, a lot of that those dates are tentative as of right now but a lot of the secondary machines will be for other processes like uh, bending brakes table stop shears uh, things like that and uh, we also need a second round of infrastructure in order to, for us to reach to reach uh, our final goals so what this all means for uh, not only this factory but for other factories um, our, our goal really here is to improve this factory but also create a transformation template um, after seeing what we have we're confident that these solutions can can work elsewhere um, simply because there's a lot of transferable knowledge um, and the transferable knowledge being you know kind of similar raw materials go into making a lot of these stoves so we're confident that these solutions can work in other environments um, some of them being you know cultivating an environment for machines to thrive uh, is an important step in the process also this idea of low capital simple machines um, being highly efficient in areas and environments like this also the steps of incremental improvements and slowly again creating an environment where machines can thrive before you bring the machines in and then the implementation of a lot of these low capital investment modern manufacturing pr principles uh, like 5s and uh, many others thank you